events of Israel yesterday on one side of the Israelites, on the other side in our scripture of the Philistines and Israel having an attack yesterday. So let's pray together as we begin our sermon. God, grateful for this opportunity to preach, to say a word on your behalf to your children, for the giants that we face are many. And we pray, Lord, that you would just give us your grace and give us your truth. Speak to us in a powerful way. And I pray, Lord, that you speak either through me or in spite of me. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're starting a sermon series today where we're looking at, uh, by the way, October is one of those strange months. It has five Sundays in it. I think it has five Mondays in it. It may either have a five Saturdays or five Tuesdays. I'm not sure, sure which. So we have four Sundays left, and I want us to think about uh, the idea of facing giants in our sermon series today. Louis Giglio is a pastor of Passion City Church in Atlanta, Georgia. Uh, in the Passion Movement. They have four campuses. I love to listen to him teach, and I love to, to watch him and preach. I listen to his podcast. He describes himself in these four ways. He says, I'm a pastor, I'm an author, I'm a communicator, and I'm a door holder. I love that, a door holder. I'm holding the door for somebody else. A few years ago, he wrote a book called Goliath Must Fall. And uh, I want to look a little deeper into that book with you over the next four weeks, and I want us to think together about the giants that we might, we might uh, face in our lives. So I want to go ahead and, and just ask you this morning, who are some of the giants, what are some of the giants that you face in your life? I'm going to give you a moment or two to think about that. Who are the giants? What are the giants that you face in your life? What are those things that seem nine foot tall? What are those things that every morning taunt us and scare us? What giants call out to you and even seem to threaten you? That's what our sermon series is about. Now, I want to ask you to hold that in your mind and heart for just a moment. I'll tell you a story from Louis's book, John, uh, Goliath Must Fall, about a, a woman who had a pet tiger. By the way, I need to tell you, this story does not end well. I will not tell you how it ends, <laughs> because it doesn't end well, and then we're in church, and you ought to hear light and love in church, right? So I won't tell you the end result. Let's just say that it didn't end well for her. Louis asks a question I think is a good one in the book. Why would anyone have a pet tiger? Our first assignment out of seminary was to a community called Harmony Grove. We moved from Dallas, Texas to Harmony Grove. Does anyone know where Harmony Grove is? <laughs> Down near Camden, Arkansas. Susie said, hey, if there's a barn in the backyard, I want us to get a pot belly pig. We moved to Harmony Grove. We pulled up to the parsonage. Lo and behold, in the back, there is a barn, but we didn't get a pot belly pig. <laughs> Two or three doors down, I was told, though I never saw him, was a man who owned his own pet tiger. I never went down that way. <laughs> I went the other way. I never went down his road because it was, uh, he had, a, I mean, lions and tigers and bears Oh my, right? <laughs> right? Oh my goodness. Uh, that's what, what I know about tigers is this. They belong in zoos. <laughs> they, they eat meat. They hunt their prey. That is their very nature. And as we know, it's hard to change your very nature. That's who they are. So how was it that this woman had, had a pet tiger? Well, it happened something like this. The woman saw the tiger as a cub. Oh, isn't he cute? She held him in her, in her arm, in her hands, and he purred like a cat does, and they fell in love instantly. At least she thought so. A bond was formed. She took him home. She gave him a name, something like Tony. 
Tony the Tiger, right? Something like that. Something like that. She gave him a warm place to sleep. She gave him a safe place to live. And everything was great until it wasn't. You see, Tony grew up. He was cute and cuddly no more. No longer did he purr. Now he growled. And he was, after all, created to be a a tiger. And one day, he attacked the woman in the story. And that's all I'm going to say about that. (laughs) Now, why would I tell you a story like that to start a sermon series about giants? Well, it's simple, really. The giants that we have... They don't start nine foot tall and bulletproof. They start cute and cuddly and small and sweet. They are comforting. They are reassuring. We have a bond with them. We give them a warm and safe place to live in our lives, in our hearts, in our minds, in our families, and in our behaviors. But then they grow up and they become strong. And they become what they were meant to be. And suddenly, they are nine foot tall. And they're taunting us. How do you get rid of a a giant? That's a great question. And one I hope we'll find the answer to over these next four sermons. So let me come back to it. Let me ask you again. Who are your giants? What are those things that seem to be nine foot tall and bulletproof and taunt you every morning? Well, could I name a few just to get us started, perhaps? Some of us know about the giant of control. I mean, we want to control everything that we are part of. And so we, we make sure that there, we don't have any surprises, that we make sure that this person does this, and this person does this, and this person does this. And if things are out of whack, if, if we can't control them, they upset us. It's a giant we face. Some of us face that giant every day, the giant of control. Or how about this guy, the giant of approval? We all like to be liked, right? We all like to be loved, And so we want to be approved. We want people to like us. And so we will do whatever it takes for people to like us. We'll say what we need to say. We'll do what we need to do because we seek their approval. And for some, it's a real real big deal. It's huge. It's a giant. Or how about the the giant of, of fear? We're going to get to him next week. I'm going to talk to him about him a little bit further and, and deeper. Now, I'm not, talking about, I'm not talking about us shaking in our shoes every day, but I'm talking about the John of fear who calls out to us and says, Be afraid. Be afraid. Be very, very afraid. Or how about this giant, this guy? The giant of rejection. Nobody likes him. Nobody wants him to be anywhere around. For one, someone to say, I don't like what you're doing. I don't like who you are. It it hurts. And we learn it from an early age, do we not? Kids don't want to play with us. Or she didn't want to date us. Or... Or we didn't get that job that we hoped and dreamed for. We didn't get into the college or, or whatever it is. The fear of rejection. He's a real giant. Or how about this guy? The giant of comfort. Preacher, did you just say comfort? Comfort's a giant? How can comfort be a giant? He's so cute and cuddly, right? John Wesley, the founder of the United Methodist Movement, used to say that I'm, I'm going to be my preachers on a regular basis because if they stay too long somewhere, they'll get too comfortable. I don't like that about our denomination. I really don't. I don't like that at all. But sometimes we do do the minimum, don't we? We only do what's required. We don't do more. And the God of, the, the John of comfort can be a problem. Are you all with me? 
Here's a real one for me. The giant of anger. Now there's some girls from my church in Paragol and I said, how are y'all? We're glad y'all are here today. Y'all never saw that in me, did you? No. But my family did and, and one day I was called upon it and I said, I've done all I can do with that giant. And so I went and I got a stone and I pulled my slingshot back and I hit that sucker between the eyes and he fell. Now he gets up every once in a while, but for the most part he's on the ground. Fear, uh, anger is a real giant. It can be really strong, right? Are y'all with me today? I may not have named your giant. There are a thousand more of them. Anxiety, addiction, whatever it is. These are some of our giants. We wrestle with them, right? We, we pray that they will go away. We wish them away. But we give them free rent. They can live inside of us free of charge. And we don't want them there. So how do we get rid of them? Well, that's the question for this series. Now, remember the story of David and Goliath with me. Even if we uh, are new to church, even if today was the first day, we have always heard of David and Goliath, right? It makes its way in, in the secular world. If, if I ask you, tell me a David and Goliath kind of story, you could, you could tell me one, right? Mostly it happens in the sports world. The underdog beats the... The powerhouse that happened in Atlanta last night. I hope it doesn't happen in Atlanta tomorrow night, right? The big team loses to the smaller team. It happens all the time. David and Goliath. This is a good story, amen? It's a strong story. But it's not just about David. And it's not just about Goliath. It's about God. Are you with me? Is about whose God is more powerful, Goliath's little g-God or Israel's strong God? Now picture the scene with me. There are two mountains, and between them is a brook that runs through it, the Valley of Eli. There's an army on each side of that valley. On one side is the army of the Philistines. On the other side is the, is the army of Israel, the children of God. They camp in tents every night, and they look across the valley at each other. They stare each other down every morning, and they look at each other. The story opens with not a lot of battle going on. They're not really fighting. They're just talking. On the Philistine side of the mountain is this giant of a man named Goliath of Gath. He was a champion fighter. Nine foot tall, right? Uh, did you hear as, as Josh read the description of his armor, how heavy that armor would have been? He would have been a burly guy. He would have been a strong guy. And he probably wouldn't have even needed that armor at all. Every day, Goliath would appear and he'd call out to the army of the Israelites and he'd say something like this, Send me your best fighter. Send me your best man. And if he beats me, we will all serve you. But if I win, then you will worship my God. It went on for 40 days. Can you imagine? 40 days. Choir, have you ever heard of the number 40 in the Bible? For 40 years, the people of God wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, right? Jesus, right after he was baptized, was whisked by the Spirit of God out to the wilderness where he was tempted by the devil at the end of how many days? 40 days. And now for 40 days, for 40 mornings... Goliath of Gath stands up and taunts the Israelites and says, send somebody to fight me. And if they win, we will serve you. But if I win, you will worship our, our God. It's not the same God. 
It's little g God. Imagine that. So on day 40, David appears. David has been home taking care of his aged father and the sheep that belongs to the family. He is the youngest of the children, you will remember. And he, he, uh, he's been anointed by Saul to be king, to be follower, but no one seemed to remember much about that. So David was bringing supplies to his brother on this 40th day, supplies that would help them eat and drink. And he heard Goliath's taunt from the hillside. And something inside of him said, whoa, wait a minute, wait a minute. The Bible says that David asked this question, who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? If I were there and I were asking that question, I would have asked it this way. Who does he think he is? Who does he think that he is? And so David says, I'll fight him. And so they give him Saul's armor. And can you imagine little David? Uh, he can't even hold up the weight of the, of the armor. And so he takes it off. And he goes to the little brook that runs through the valley there. And he pulled out five smooth stones. And he put it in his, his uh, shepherd's uh, satchel. And he got out his slingshot. And he pulled it back. And he aimed high. And he hit Goliath right between the eyes, and he fell to the ground. And we sometimes forget about this part of the story. He took out the sword, and he cut Goliath's head off just to make sure he was dead. That's the story of David and Goliath. And now you've heard preachers like me say things like this. David was an underdog. You can be an underdog too. Look what he did. You can do it too. All you need is a smooth stone and a slingshot, some preachers have said. Aim high, hit him between the eyes, and watch him fall. The problem with all that is that if you think about the giants being things like addictions and worry and fear and approval and comfort, they're not just nine foot tall and you're facing them. They're nine foot tall and they're inside you. How do you fight those giants inside of you? Well, one of the things that you do is you say something like this. Who do you think that you are? Church, would, would y'all say that with me? Who do you think that you are? Whatever giant you face, friends, may be big. But hear this line, if you don't hear anything else, those things are not bigger than our God. Amen? They are not bigger than our God. A few verses before the stone makes its way from the slingshot to the giant's forehead, David says this line, All those gathered here will know that it is not by spear, by sword or spear that the Lord saves, for the battle is the Lord's. Amen? The battle is the Lord's. Sometimes we forget that. So we're going to be looking at some of these giants. We're going to look at fear next week. I invite you to think about your giants, but I encourage you more to remember that they're big, but they're not as big as our God. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, we know the giant's name. It's not just Goliath, it's fear, it's anxiety, it's a whole host of different names. And they call out to us every day, which seems like not 40 days, maybe it seems like 40 years. And we say, what are we going to do with that giant? When God says to us, I'm bigger than that giant, and I know what to say to him, I know what to do for him. So, Lord, let us remember that we may be in a battle, but the battle is the Lord's. And we trust the Lord. And we love you, Lord.
Amen.